Hello everyone, you are listening to She Leads with Carly and I am so excited to be kicking off season two. I cannot wait to continue speaking to these incredible leaders from all different worlds and to just hear the lessons they've learned throughout their career that led them to where they are today. And there's no better way to kick off season two than with my first guest, Brandi Chastain, a National Soccer Hall of Famer. For those who may not know her, Brandi is a two-time Women's World Cup champion, two-time Olympic gold medalist, and most really know her after she ripped her shirt off after making the final PK in the 1999 Women's World Cup against China to secure the victory. Truly incredible, we talk about this moment. As well as in this chat, Brandy not only shares the lessons she's learned in moments like those throughout her soccer career, whether it's having positive self-talk and inner confidence, but also how she has used those skills in transitioning away from the game as she's now working at Cheer City Media. She chats about the importance of being comfortable with the uncomfortable and being okay with saying you don't understand something. Okay, I don't want to share too much about this conversation, but I absolutely love this episode with Brandy, and I'm sure you will too, so enjoy. Hello, Brandy Chastain. I am so excited not only to just have you on my show, but to be the first episode of season two. So yeah, season two. Very exciting. Woo! And, you know, it's a weird coincidence, but first episode of season one was with Julie Foudy, so not ah, sure. I think there's some, so I don't you, know. So you've moved up, is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, Brandy, for obviously for those who don't know you, not in the soccer world, or I don't even know who may not, but still, I'll give some background. You are a two-time World Cup champion, Olympic gold medalist, two-time Olympic gold medalist, and, you know, we can see in your background, you are probably most well-known for that <laughs> last PK in the 1999 Women's World Cup. So I guess first, you, why don't you tell me exactly like what happened, you know, why there is a framed sports bra behind you and, and yeah, and then we'll go deeper into it. But first, give me some, <laughs> a little background about that. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll make it short. Okay. Um, you know, we made the U.S. team made it to the World Cup final, which was, I think, the hope and dreams of every player on the team, uh, our staff, the administration at U.S. Soccer, uh, Women's World Cup Committee. Obviously, it it, it proved to be the most um, sought after ticket um, ever in women's sports, and we filled the Rose Bowl, ninety thousand plus people sold, I think, over a million tickets and had millions and millions, uh, tens of millions of people watching. And here we are in the final in one of the most historic stadiums in our country at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. And now we get to penalty kicks. We've gone 120 minutes of scoreless soccer, which for some people listening may be like, oh, my God, that's torturous. But it was I, I hadn't watched the full game until probably about it was in COVID that I watched it wow, and really? I realized what an intense match this was. It was, a, it must've been a, over a hundred degrees on the field. And what I love so much about watching it was the, you could see um, the intensity obviously was there just the amount of physical um, endurance and the stamina that was necessary. But then you could see the mental um, fortitude of both of the teams. Yeah. It was like each team was willing to bend a little bit, but nobody was willing to break like in that final part. Right. And so that was really outstanding. Um, then getting to the penalty kicks, you know, for me personally, I, I kind of have a, a history of penalty kicks in my life that, um, you know, as a, a former Stanford soccer player, you know, winning a national championship is the most coveted Thing. And obviously, as an international player, the most coveted thing is winning a World Cup. Of course. Uh, my senior year, I was in the semifinals for the national championship, and we went to penalty kicks, and my penalty kick was saved. So real quick moral to the story is don't worry. You might fall down, but you can always get back up. Mm-hmm. And so earlier in 1999, China and, and the U.S. were playing in Portugal, and we had a penalty kick. And I stepped up to take it and the goalkeeper was standing right in front of me, which is unusual, as you know, because the goalkeeper is usually back on the line trying to get herself or himself ready. And 
as I looked up from after placing the ball, it was like two boxers in the middle of the ring. And she is a quirky character, as some goalkeepers are. And she smiled and winked, and it caught me off guard. So psychologically, I was in a not the place I wanted to be. Right. And so the whistle blew. I hit it. It hit the crossbar. It went out. Ultimately, we ended up win, uh, losing that game 2-1. to one. Yeah. So fast forward to 1999 and now, I mean, sorry, into July and now it's my turn. All the players on my team had made theirs. China, Brianna Scurry had saved the third kicker. And once that happened, to be honest with you, I knew I had an ease and a calm come over me because to save a penalty kick is truly remarkable. It's so hard. And so... On my journey from the midfield to the ball, it was just don't look at the goalkeeper. Don't look at the goalkeeper. Because I didn't want to give her that opportunity to To do what she did to me last time. Yeah. And so I feel very fortunate that all the lessons I learned in soccer helped me kind of be in the moment. And Mm -hmm. I think part of our conversation today will be talking about that. Definitely. And uh, ah, little known fact is that I had taken all my penalties with my right foot and prior to going out to the middle, coach DeChico had said, Hey, you want to take a kick? And I said, of course, like, yes. Um, I would have taken a kick in the run of play if there was a penalty. Right. So I thought it was a little odd. And then he goes, okay, you're going to take it with your left foot. And he kind of like sped away. And I think because I was so exhausted, I didn't spend any time thinking about it. Like, what does he mean by that? Why is he choosing? So, so hold. So first of all, for, you know, for non-soccer players, like, yes, at this level, like everyone, you're strong with both feet, but still like, that's still crazy to say, you know, a PK, it's all about like mentality, confidence, again, like being the fifth player brings itself its own pressures and, you know, mentality is even more important. But then, you know, to have your coach say, okay, you're going to take it with, you know, maybe your left foot, I'm guessing, is your weaker foot, um, given that you took, I mean, probably the same, but still, given that you've taken the rest, <laughs> right. you're right. So, right. So when did he tell you that? And what was going through your mind at that moment? Well, um, he came up to me as we were kind of doing a little bit of cool down stretch, trying to uh, get our legs to be working right before going to the center of the field. No way. And he was kind of checking in with everybody. Yeah. So I would say it was like five minutes before that happened. He, he, Crazy. and you know, the thing here's again, this is another, we have so many things we can talk about this morning, yeah. but I think another segue um, about this conversation is talking about leadership, right? Understanding the capacity of the people who work with you yeah. and work for you. And as leaders, how do we push and pull the people that are near us to be uncomfortable and to feel confidence and to know that they have people that believe in them? And I think that was probably the greatest gift that Tony gave to our team, honestly, was this. He was he was the coach and he was the leader, but he had tremendous trust and respect for the players. And because of that, we had tremendous trust and respect for him and yeah. so when he said something you you said okay I'll do it like for me I was a forward I was a leader of I mean I led the collegiate ranks in scoring my first year in college yeah. and you know my position was always about scoring goals not defending them so when he told me when I came back to the national team that I would be a defender and not a forward you know, in that moment, that's a fork in the road, right? And you can decide, no, I'm too prideful. And this is who I am. And this is what I do. And this is where I should be. And I'm going to stand up for that. Or you can say, okay, I know all that I know about that position. And how can I be great in this other one and Amazing. use those tools, which, which I learned, actually, were really to my benefit, because before the forwards knew what they were going to do, I knew what they were going to do because that's what I used to do. Yes. And I think, yeah. and even, even with that lesson, I think it's so applicable to, you know, especially that transition from youth club players to college. Cause a lot yeah. of times you come in, they have many forwards, strong forwards, and maybe they need you as a defender. That's what happened with me. And I know a lot of other players. So it's almost taking that mentality being like, okay, I've played forward, but now I'm going to defend those forwards. I know what they're thinking and that could be to my advantage. So I right. love that. I think it's a great mentality. Um, well, thank you. So, yeah. So continue. 
you know, we're not done with getting to the sports bra. So <laughs> right. you're, you're walking up to the penalty kick. You're not looking the yes. keeper in the eye. And what, yeah, what happens in those next moments? Well, it's incredible to think, you know, I think a lot of people um, ha- don't have practice in when things are really chaotic and there's a lot of noise and the ability to narrow that focus and to make things quiet and to be in the moment is a real um, talent, yeah. really. It's something that's developed, right? But imagine now being in that world and all of a sudden now things are silent. So when things are silent, what happens is now all of a sudden things can start to come in, which now that's a real talent, right? To be able to be in silence and still not allow your thoughts to wander or to think of, you know, what the pot- potential is not in a positive way. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I have to say, and this is something that I learned through this process of being with the national team and playing sports all my life and um, taking risks and having great role models is that I have to own that moment and say, I'm really proud of the fact that the coach presented me with a, a challenge. I didn't question um, his belief in me. Then I didn't look inside and go, oh my gosh, can I do this? I said, I'm going to do this. And I did. And so, you know, I think the putting down the ball and not lifting my eyes to the goalkeeper. And you know, Carly, it's like when you're focused on the ball, peripheral vision, you can see kind of what's happening. So I didn't need to really lift my head to to recognize where the goalkeeper was. And once the whistle was blown in that silence, which was like this cacophony, it, it just like echoed. I stepped up and did exactly what I've been doing my whole life since I was seven years old. And as you say, you know, the, with the sports bra, it, it's, um, here's my little, Oh, I love it. (laughs) Um, you know, it was just, it was just the most pure response to the moment. Uh, You never know what you're going to emotionally feel when you have the moment, whether it's, you know, you go into a big meeting and you successfully, Um, give your presentation and everybody loves it, Um, you know, or you have a relationship with your child and you see them blossom into this person that you hope they would become. Oh my gosh, it's so fulfilling. Like I have chills thinking about it. You know, you get this moment to step up to a penalty kick and you let go of all the things that, that other people or people are trying to put on you and you just do what you can do. And I think for women in particular and young girls and young women and women, You know, we don't, we have a, we've had a tendency because of social or cultural norms that we haven't allowed ourselves to express that delight and that joy. And I think what we're all finding now in 2020 in this hideousness of this pandemic, we're finding our strength, right? We're finding our courage. We're finding our voice. We're saying enough is enough. And we're going to be moving forward in a way that we are confident doing. And yeah. to me now, as 20 years later, I see that celebration as a statement to that um, progress. I love it. I love it so much. So, okay, you know, you mentioned, and this is such an important topic, and I don't even know if it's, if there's like a concrete answer or advice that you can give, but, you know, you talk about how it almost relates to, you know, that mentality that like silencing the the negative thoughts, the self doubt, the whatever it may be, what advice, like how can we really better at, like become better at, you know, removing those negative thoughts and, and always enhancing inner confidence. Cause I think like truly, especially for penalty kicks or, you know, going to do a presentation, a lot of it is like, we're prepared. We've done this our whole life. You know, we know how to pass a soccer ball. So at this point, like, it becomes a whole new level of pressure. How do we still maintain that level of like even killed mindset and then also that amazing confidence that we, we have? Well, I think, I think it's, there's different um, layers to the answer, to be honest with you. And I think part one is personally, we all have to look at ourselves and say, I'm good enough, right? I'm good enough. I wouldn't be in this position if I wasn't good enough. So, you know, you said you had the saying, you know, negative, right? Negative things. So what I would like for us to practice is positive self-talk, 
yeah. positive imagery. Um, you know, we used to watch, uh, we had video, this is back in the day, Carly. So <laughs> everybody, when you hear this, you're going to be like, what's that? Um, uh, when I say a VHS tape, it's not, it wasn't digital at the time. Right. So yeah. we would have our VHS, VHS tape and, and we would watch it. It was like three to five minutes of, you could have whatever you wanted on there. Anything that made you feel good, anything that put you in a happy place, anything that, uh, gave you confidence. You know, I think a lot of us, took some of the things that we did, but we also put in our teammates, like great plays by Christine Lilly or Mia Hamm or Julie Foudy. Right. And because that's inspiring, right? So I think having great positive self-talk um, is important. Now, I think to say that is easier than to do it. Yeah. So I get that part, but practice in that vein yields huge rewards, right? I was, I'm trying to learn, this is for our conversation, I, th- I hope uh, in, a, in the next few minutes or so, yeah. is, you know, developing the person you want to become, right? Mm. And if you only, for me, I've been in sports my whole life, and now I'm venturing into something I never, ever imagined that I would. And I, I also came from a background where I didn't have luxury dollars growing up. I didn't have investment. I didn't understand how money worked. And now at 52 years old, I'm trying to become financially literate. And I'm doing this while sitting next to my 14-year-old son because I want him to grow up understanding how money can work for you, right. how it could work against you. Um, you know, how can you put it into, into the community and get, you know, great results and, and feel intrinsically rewarded. So, you know, this concept of, you know, you have to be um, – willing to see the potential in yourself and to be confident that you're not going to be perfect. Yeah. Practicing these, ex- these um, abilities is, is truly important. So when you, like this morning, I'm on the Peloton and I am huffing and puffing and I'm feeling like it's time to quit. It's time to quit. I don't have to be an Olympian this morning. <laughs> and yeah. then I'm like, but just do it. You know, you can do it. You know, you can just dig down. It's going to hurt for a little bit, but you're going to be all right. You're going to be so happy that you did. Right. So those are the kind of messages I think um, in terms of putting, getting us into a place where then we can then take the next step, which is stand up, have our voice heard, yeah. um, you know, put an idea out there, uh, not be afraid to have someone say, well, that's not the direction we're going to go right now. Okay, great. I'm going to put it in my back pocket. I'll bring it out when, Another time, you know, not to be afraid of those moments because, boy, in soccer, if I learned anything, this is what I learned. You're going to miss more than you make. Yeah. And it's okay because that's that's the nature of growing. That's the nature of developing. That's the nature of becoming the person you hope to become. And, uh, you know, even in this moment, even in this moment right here, when there were so many people saying so many good things. Yeah. I, I think there was people who would said, why did you do that? That's sexualized sports or this, that's a negative And you, you know, is it contrived? And I love those people because now I got a chance to really evaluate. I t- took a step back. I asked what, why did that happen? How did that happen? What did it mean in the moment? Did it mean something different than it means now? And I could have a really good conversation. You might not agree with the moment, but let's talk about it. Maybe we come closer right. together than farther apart. Yeah, no, I think that's great. So, Brandy, you gave so much in that answer. I love it. I really love it. Um, and one, so I'm going to tap into the one in particular where, you know, you're talking about the transition to what yeah. you're doing today. And before you go into, you know, you're working at City Cheers Media, before we go into that, I want to know how was that transition mentally because you know you know as a soccer player you reach the absolute highest like every every young girl soccer dream you know absolute highest and so reaching that level even you know getting to play at Stanford it's part of your identity and it's a huge part of your identity so kind of transitioning away from the game it's definitely a lot of people have these you know hard transitions because it's what else am I good at or who am I without soccer so I want to know, what's your perspective? How was it for you, you know, transitioning? You know, you're obviously still in the soccer world, coaching youth, coaching Santa Clara. So, 
you know, mm-hmm. while you are an idol to me, you're also a rival, I must say. Um, <laughs> That's but, good. We all need that. Yeah, we need that. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, so how was that for you? What made you say, you know, I want to explore something else. I want to become financially literate and, and whatnot. Well, I think number one, um, transit, the word transition in soccer is so critical, right? Mm-hmm. So um, you will have the ball and you won't have the ball. You're going to, there's four phases of the game, attacking, transition to defending, defending, transition to attacking. So y- you have to be ready. Um, and transition is can be really difficult for a lot of players because yeah. they're either all in on this bucket or all in on this bucket. And in between, it's like, mm, it's not that fluid, right? right? It's not that smooth. So I, I'm going to say uh, up front, it was difficult to yeah. go from being a player to not being a player on the national team. I wasn't ready at the time mm. to retire. Uh, it was not my choice. I would have... I wanted to stay longer. I asked to be uh, have a chance to try out against those players who uh, were thought to be um, the players on the team, right. and was not given that opportunity. So that was really hard. And I and I think unlike today, which I think we're becoming wiser about transitions. We're, we're, you know, this could be in family, it could be in loss, it could be in gaining new relationships, it could be in and just about transition exists everywhere, but in sports it's not really been an area that was covered because everybody is so in the moment of sports and so it's true. every season. Oh, the next season and the next season. Yeah. So, so I think there's a lot of now literature. I, I have quite a few people who have written some books now about this transition. And actually there's going to be a gal, um, Cassidy, who was a diver at Stanford, uh, mm-hmm. who I worked with for this reality TV program called splash. I watched it I, by the way. I, hurled myself off of the damn 10 meter platform. I remember that show. Wow. What a, what a throwback. That's great. Yeah. And she's writing it because as an Olympian for herself, you know, she's writing a book about this transition that nobody prepared her for. Yeah. And so I think because I was thrust into transition, um, and like you said, I, my heart and my love and my passion has always been in soccer that I do stay in the game. It's very valuable to me, yeah. intrinsically rewarding. Um, I, I see that I have a lot of experience that I can give back and I absolutely feel like that is a part of who I will be forever. Yeah. Um, you know, starting a nonprofit with Julie Foudy, um, here in the Bay area, the Bay area women's sports initiative, which maybe even you, participated in with our bossy girls yeah um you know doing something in the community is has been it's kind of what i filled that void with because i could be active i could give back to to some girls who really need some support yeah and trying to um find my i don't even know what the word is i think it's my peace Mm -hmm. with moving out of that space into something and so I wasn't really prepared to work with City Cheers, which is, I think, part of the fun of the story, because the gentleman who is the founder um, and the CEO, his name is Winston Jabe, I coached his son in high school soccer yeah. here in San Jose at Bellarmine College Prep. And he came to me and said, I have a job for you. And I said, I didn't know I was looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he just said, you know, I think you're going to be great. I watch you with your teams. I love the way you communicate with them. I love your... Uh, intensity, but I also love your compassion with your players, you know, your thoughtfulness, the way you, um, you know, move pieces and get teams to be successful. And I want that in my environment. And I thought, well, if this isn't a, a Tony DeChico moment, moving me from forward to defender, yeah. I should say yes to this opportunity. So I did. And then for the last six months, my head's been spinning, right? So, um, but it's been, I think it's been a good exercise of self-confidence and finding that self-confidence and maybe not finding it in places that I thought it was going to exist, but mm-hmm. in other places. It's about being open to a whole new world that I, the language was literally, I didn't possess any of the vernacular mm-hmm. and, and yet somehow I'm figuring it out and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to use all the skills that I have in soccer 
and, and translate those into a business environment and meeting people who I think are absolutely so brilliant and not being intimidated by their brilliance and, and saying, I don't know, I don't know anything about this. Can you tell me yeah. how to understand this? And I actually had a gentleman, his name is Tom Gardner. He and his brother David are the founders of The Motley Fool. They, they do investments and just two really phenomenal guys. And Tom said to me, he's like, Brandy, you know what? What's really impressive is that you've been so successful in your life. And here you are saying you don't know something and being okay with saying that. And I was like, yeah, because I don't know what, I'm, what, you, yeah. what you're talking about. But I want to learn. And so I think for everybody out there, I think we're all vulnerable to that. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're a CEO of a company or, you know, you think you're the best parent out there or we're all vulnerable to not knowing something and to be in that space and be okay with that, I think is really positive. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't look at that and say, Oh, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Um, I don't have to be. And I think, yeah. and I think that's also a very important skill to have is like, you know, being comfortable with saying you don't know. A lot of people, yeah. they, they stay quiet. They don't want to be per perceived as, you know, the one who doesn't know how to do that or who doesn't know what right. that, that term means. Um, right. And I also find it, it's interesting because I'm sure whether you know it or not, you know, when people talk to you, they also feel this, you know, you know, young soccer girls, they feel this huge intimidation. So it's almost <laughs> like, you know, roles reversing. Now you're in this whole new world. You're talking to people. Um, so I think, I think that's crazy. So before we, you know, finalize with these fun questions that I have, um, tell me, you know, advice, if you could give like short advice to girls who are transitioning to, you know, away from soccer, away from that player identity, that, that love for the game, but you know, maybe it's not the right time to leave, but who knows? Um, how would you say, like, what would you say is important aspect to take with you in your transition? Uh, I think number one is you have so many tools. You're not even sure that you don't even know that you have, yeah. uh, but they'll come to your rescue. Sometimes they'll come to the forefront when uh, somebody needs a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, soccer for me specifically ha is a really uh, a microcosm of the world because there's lots of problems that you have to solve in the moment. You have to be confident in making decisions. Uh, you at times will be the quarterback, so you're going to be the leader, and other times you're going to be the support system. So uh, I think you're stronger and and more uh, powerful than you you know you are. Mm -hmm. So own that. That's number one. That's my bit of advice. Uh, number two is comes from my mom. Uh, she was a woman who started. You know, she she ha we had two kids in my family, and she was a stay at home mom. And we, we lived here in San Jose in the Silicon Valley when IBM and Hewlett Packard were the biggest of the biggest in software and hardware. Yeah. And she went from being a teacher's aide to, you know, to in work to becoming a vice president of a, a temporary service employment agency that where she was probably one of the most people in finding the next great executive for IBM or Hewlett Packard. And she had to learn, like I'm learning, how to do that. And what I saw from her every day was just this confidence. She put on a suit and she went to work and without sitting me down and say, listen, I'm going to teach you a lesson. She lived it, right? She was an example. Yeah. And so her mantra to me was find your yes. Mm. There's going to be so many people out there who say, no, you can't No, this isn't for you. No, you're not good enough. No, it's not the right time. Okay. That's not my issue. I, I'm going to find my yes. And to be fearless in that, I think, does take um, thick skin. But you can find your yes. Yeah. There's more than one way to get over a barrier. And she taught me that by living. And so I'm, I'm thrilled I get to experience that every day, really. Yeah. And Brandy, another thing is, you know, finding your yes. You also teach us that it's never, there's no age limit to find your yes. You know, a lot of people think, <laughs> A lot of people think that, okay, I need to find my career, you know, at 22 years old and that's where I'm going to be. But, you know, you in the soccer world, someone gave you this opportunity. You said yes. And now 
you're in this whole new world. You're learning a whole different um, environment that's, you know, very disconnected from soccer, yet you bring so many skills from soccer into it. So I love it. I think that's a beautiful full circle, um, full, full, full circle moment. So, okay, Brandy, I'm going to finish off. One, what is, you know, soccer aside, what is a passion you have? You know, what's just something that you, you love doing? Oh gosh, I love being active. I have, I I just have a great desire to move all the time, whether that's on the Peloton bike in the morning or whether that's going to play golf in the afternoon with my husband or friends. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love to be challenged. I honestly, I'm a glutton for punishment. (laughs) <laughs> in, in that way, right? I'm just up for anything. I want to say yes all the time. Yeah. Maybe that's also a fault, Carly, to be honest, because I try to do everything yeah. all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, no, that's... I'm not great at, I'm not great at sitting right like this all the time. <laughs> that's really what okay, I'm not so, great at. so I'm glad we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, but <laughs> my last question that, you know, I, I finished off every episode, season one, and I'm going to do the same. So first, I'm going to ask you, I don't know if you remember when I told you I'm going to ask you this, but I want to know what is a talent that you have that not many people know about? So almost a weird hidden talent. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go first. And so what I usually do is I, (laughs) no pressure to show it, but I show (laughs) mine. (laughs) This is awesome. So what I usually do is throw blueberries in the air, but what I have okay. now are grapes. So I might be transitioning to grapes. We'll see. Okay. Okay. So I throw them up in the air and cast them in my mouth. Haven't done this in a while, so we'll see. Okay. Come on. You got it. Oh, no. First episode <laughs> always has to. It's okay. We got another one. It's okay. 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 All right. Oh, no. Another throw. Another throw. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's all right. I'm a little rusty. I'll awesome. soon be back in it. Oh, <laughs> God, what's a hidden talent? I wish I, I, um, I wish something popped into my head right away. Um, <laughs> you know, I think mm, I, I would probably say something in the kitchen. Like I, cool. I'm a, I'm kind of like a under the cover, um, hidden cook chef you know like I I love to like life I love to explore and like I throw a little bit of this and I throw a little (laughs) bit of that and then it's like then I ask people to try it (laughs) what's your what's your if you could pick a favorite dish what's your favorite thing to cook yeah I think there's two things I I I wasn't really a soup person growing up but I love making soup I love making a butternut squash soup with apples and some curry and some cayenne and just like this sweet, spicy, beautiful pot of, <laughs> you know, it just like fills it. people full, right? Like soup is warm. It's comforting. Yeah. Um, so I love making soup. Um, and I think the second one is I grew up in Northern California. So we, you know, we have, there's a, Hisp- a Hispanic, uh, Latina kind of, um, uh, environment near yeah. near here so I grew up on Christmas Eve and and Christmas having tamales and menudo mm. and with a family from around the corner so I like to make Mexican food my mother-in-law is uh, is Mexican so we have always have fresh um, beans in the house yeah. and uh, I love to make um, enchiladas verde that's one of my wow. favorites um, it's something my mom and I would do together so mm. That, you know, when I'm missing her, I make that and it makes me feel, it makes me feel good. Oh, I love it. So great. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are invited to come over for both of those. Oh, anytime. amazing. Sounds good. Well, <laughs> Brandy, I want to thank you. You know, so excited that not only are you on my show again, but first episode, a great way to start the next season. <laughs> um, so really, thank you. I learned so much and I'm just so excited for others to just learn from you, hear from your story and, and whatnot. So thank you. Well, Carly, it's my, it is my pleasure. I love that we have become friends, even in our rivalry. I think that's awesome. Uh, I'm, I want you to remember, uh, even though I'm starting your season two, and this is for everybody else out there, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. So let's hope that this is a great start to a great second season. Definitely. I couldn't agree more. So that sounds good. Thank you again, Brandy.